Today we're going to be talking about one of the real disasters of the 20th century, the First World War. It has been described by many historians as the war that deeply challenged and further changed Western civilization. According to some, it actually destroyed Western civilization. We are still living with its aftermath and trying to pick up the pieces. As we're going to see, there's a lot of truth to that. There was something absolutely devastating that took place, not only materially, in terms of what happened physically in the war, millions and millions killed, but also, as we will see, it really closed a deep intellectual challenge. And so we're going to be interested in what it did to ideas more than what it actually did to economies, what it did to human lives, although that's an important part of it too, and we'll look at that. <laughs> now, <laughs> World War I did bring the 19th century to a sudden end. In fact, Paul Johnson starts his book Modern Times on the intellectual history as well as the physical history of the 20th century um, in 1990, after the First World War, because he says really the 19th century included those decades leading up to the war, it wasn't until after the war that modernity really started that the 20th century began. However you think of that, it certainly did fundamentally alter the intellectual framework that we had inherited from the 19th century. Sir Edward Gray, on the outbreak of war, said the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetimes. And that's something that has been taken as emblematic. As we'll see later, Philip Larkin wrote a poem, 1914, in which he has the line repeated, never such innocence again. And there is a sense in which World War I really devastated not only an ideology, but the faith that people had in it, a sense of innocence, a sense of unwavering commitment to certain truths and certain norms. All of those things were called into question by the war. Well, how on earth did this catastrophe come about? Here's a map of Europe in 1908. If you look carefully, you'll see that some parts of it look familiar, but other parts look pretty unfamiliar. What in particular looks strange there? Germany. Yeah, Germany is one thing. Germany extends way into the east, as you can see, uh, covering a significant part of what is today Poland. Any other things you see that are odd? The Ottoman Empire, exactly. There is a very large region in Central Europe which was Austria Hungary. In fact, there's a joke that uh, an Austrian Duke was having lunch with someone in New York, and he was asked, So later, you're going to go to the Austria Hungary soccer match? And he said, Oh, no, but how interesting. Who are we playing? <laughs> uh, well, anyway, old habits die hard. But yes, Austria Hungary was one large empire, really, covering much of Central and Eastern Europe. There are other things that might strike you as odd there, too. Turkey, notice, is extending significantly into the Balkans. Uh, Serbia, Romania are just slivers of what they are today, as is Greece, and so forth. Now, all of that was soon about to change. There were a variety of wars in the Balkans in the time between 1878 and 1912, you can see a lot of confusing mess there as regions and boundaries change. The reason is that the Ottoman Empire had conquered most of the Balkans from a pretty early period. Serbia fell in 1389, the Battle of Kosovo Polya, the Field of the Blackbirds. Uh, Constantinople fell in 1453. Uh, there were Ottoman troops at the gates of Vienna as late as 1683. And so this region had been under Muslim control for about 500 years. Starting around the 1830s, it began to break free. And here we see how things were developing late in the 19th century and early in the 20th century, a series of wars, a series of things that were shifting boundaries back and forth. The one that is most immediately preceding uh, the First World War, well, really there are two, there is the First Balkan War in 1912, where Serbia, Greece, Montenegro, and Bulgaria drive the Ottoman Empire out of Europe. And so for the first time, Turkey retreats to just a tiny little sliver on the other side of the Balkans. And the second one is actually started by Bulgaria to push back Serbia and Greece. <laughs> uh, it really doesn't accomplish much of anything. So by 1913, the boundaries look something like this. Serbia, as you can see, is larger. Romania is still a sliver of its former self. There's a large area, Bosnia Herzegovina, which was controlled by Austria Hungary, but was claimed by Serbia, and so leads to the conflict that produced the war. Well, 
here is a sort of close-up map <laughs> of how things were in the lower regions of the Balkans. Uh, unless you can read Russian, you may not understand the, the place names there. However, it shows you a close-up of how the map was going at that point. In the Second War, Bulgaria was hoping for more territory. Nothing really worked out. So in 1914, the map of Europe looked like this. And there were a series of disputed regions in Eastern Europe. You can see perhaps more clearly what was going on if you look at this map. This is a map that shows you various peoples, uh, sort of ethnic groups. And you can see the Germans are mostly in Germany, uh, though there are significant numbers over in the Austria, 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 Austria Hungarian Empire. You see the English are mostly in England and so forth. But then look at Eastern Europe. There are all sorts of things that are puzzling. As you can see, Serbs are spread not only from Serbia, but as well throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina and parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When my own ancestors came here in the 1890s, they listed Austria-Hungary as their place of origin, even though they were ethnically Serbs. You can see that that empire itself is a conglomeration of all sorts of different ethnic groups. Slovaks, Hungarians, Austrians, Czechs, Serbs, Romanians, and so forth. And all of those peoples spoke different languages. In fact, Hungarian isn't even an Indo-European language, and so a lot of these languages don't have a very close relationship with one another. My great-grandmother, when she came to this country, could read newspapers in six languages. She needed to do that as a citizen of Austria-Hungary. Uh, there were all sorts of languages spoken by all sorts of groups. In fact, that leads to one of the main problems the war resulted from, which is that Austria-Hungary was in danger of falling apart. And to some extent, it was Austrian officials trying to keep it together that caused the problem. Here's a close-up of Austria-Hungary itself. You can see the different language groups and the different ethnic groups that make it up. It's got some organization to it, but there's a huge amount of diversity within one empire. Well, that caused a variety of problems. What prompted the war directly was the assassination of the Archie. Francis Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And so, how did that come about? It's actually a remarkable story and a shocking story. It is tempting for historians to think that history is the play of large social forces, and that if one person hadn't done something, well, then somebody else would have. But what produced World War I was actually a bizarre series of seemingly accidental events. And we're going to see some of that in what we look at today. The Archduke and his wife came to Sarajevo. Here you can see their, the beginning of their state visit. And by the end of that day, notice June 28, 1914, he had been shot and his wife had been too. The person who shot him is here being arrested, Gabriel Prince. There is the car in which he was riding. And there is the bridge on which the assassination took place. As you can see, it's quite narrow. There isn't much room to maneuver. And that turned out to be important to the event. How did it come about? It was front page news all over the world. But in fact, it's a remarkable story. The Archduke was assassinated by a radical Serbian group that was claiming Bosnia-Herzegovina, and the capital of that region was Sarajevo. Hence, they saw his visit to Sarajevo as an attempt to assert Austro-Hungarian dominance over the region that they thought was properly part of Serbia. So there was a small group called the Black Hand. It was this radical group that had committed itself to assassinating the Archduke as a protest against Austro-Hungarian dominance. Well, there were six people who were to be assassins along the parade. The first one jumped out from the crowd and threw a grenade into the car, or at least tried to throw it into the car of the Archduke. He was quite an athletic man. He saw it coming. He jumped up and batted it away. It exploded. A couple of people were had minor injuries, but he was safe. At that point, the officials in Sarajevo said, look, let's call this all up. Let's stop the parade, and, and you know, let's just get you to your destination. His response was to say, oh, how many attempts of my life can there be in one day? <laughs> and so he insisted that they go forward. The Sarajevo officials convinced him at least to change the route. And so there was a last minute change of route. Well, at some point, the driver got confused. And so <laughs> they ended up, in the latter part of that, actually going on the original route because the driver had taken a wrong turn. 
However, there were six assassins. The first one threw the grenade and was deflected. The second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth all chickened out. They all saw the archduke approaching and in the end couldn't do it. But one had a pistol, one had another kind of bomb. Um, they all chickened out. And finally, Gavrilo Prince was the last, the sixth assassin along the road. He was the failsafe who was supposed to do it if everyone else had somehow failed. Well, he had been sitting there, but he had heard through the grapevine in reaction to the first attempt that the prey route had been changed, and he thought it was no longer coming near him. So he went into a bar and had a beer. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, he hears a commotion outside. What happened? The driver took a wrong turn and ended up back on the original route, got onto the bridge, and suddenly he realized, wait, I've taken the wrong turn, stops the car, and begins to back up. Prince runs out of the bar, realizes, good grief, there's the archduke, pulls out his gun, and shoots. Fires a couple of shots. One, unfortunately, hits the side of the car, and is deflected, and hits an artery of Sophie, his wife, and she dies almost immediately. The archduke is also hit. He dies also uh, quite as quickly. In any event, Princip is immediately arrested, as you saw, and is taken to jail. It turns out that he dies in jail a few months later. He was mortally ill. He was already dying, basically, which is part of how he was recruited to become an assassin. In any case, few people, when they saw these headlines, thought this is the beginning of a major world war. It looked like something complicated happening in the Balkans. There had been a war in 1912. There had been a war in 1913. There had been fighting really all throughout the previous hundred years as the Ottoman Empire had been pushed back and various ethnic groups were competing for territory. And so almost no one thought that this was going to produce a major war. Nevertheless, it did. How did it happen? Well, part of this I'm sure you know from your high school history class. Austria-Hungary issued an ultimatum to Serbia. It was an ultimatum that was designed to be rejected. It had a lot of things that Serbia could not agree to and remain uh, a sovereign nation. It was designed to be unacceptable. Actually, Serbia accepted almost all of it except for one provision, but it did reject that provision. In any case, the response was that Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. However, Serbia had a treaty with Russia. Russia felt compelled to join the Serbian side. Germany had a treaty with Austria-Hungary, and so felt compelled to join the Austro-Hungarian side. France had a defense treaty with Russia, and so became involved in the conflict as well. Britain joined France because they had an alliance. The Ottoman Empire was allied with Germany, so they ended up in an alliance. Consequently, most of Europe divided into two groups, the central powers, consisting of Austria-Hungary, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire, and then the allies, primarily England, France, Serbia, and Russia. Though, as we'll see, a few other countries joined in as well. Now, that makes it sound like a series of collapsing dominoes. And in part, that's what it was. It started with the Austro-Hungarian government declaring war on Serbia, and then everything else toppled. But in fact, it wasn't really quite so simple. Who wanted war? Nobody surely wanted a world war, but who wanted war at all? In the end, almost no one. There were two people in Austria, the foreign minister, Berkton, and Field Marshal Conrad, the head of the armed forces, who were concerned about the fact that Austria-Hungary had so many different ethnic groups, so many different languages, and was beginning to break apart. There were movements for self-determination, and lots of movements, like the Black Hand, that were insisting on separate rule, self-rule for the Austrians, the Czechs, uh, the Serbs, uh, the Hungarians, etc., etc. Much of what's happened actually after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, but there was a fear of Serbia and a fear of that general process of self determination. So these guys basically insisted on the ultimatum. Now, actually, the Emperor Franz Joseph and the Hungarian Prime Minister, Tishan, they didn't want to do this. <laughs> uh, but Berktolk and Conrad lied to them, telling them that Serbia had attacked Austria Hungary to get the leaders to actually agree to fight. So the whole declaration of war was, in a sense, engineered by two people in Austria-Hungary. Two people who were not the top of their countries and were actually deceiving the leaders of those countries. In Germany, the Kaiser didn't want a war. He was racing a sailboat off the coast of Norway. Keep in mind this happened in June. Most of Europe just goes on vacation in June. And so most of these guys were on vacation. The Kaiser was off racing a boat. 
And as we'll see, the same was happening with the French Prime Minister. As this developed between the assassination at the end of June and the outbreak of war in August, most of the key players were inaccessible. They were off on the boat. The big blue one. <laughs> but many of them, they were not very easily accessible. Today, we would think, surely these people have hotlines, they can pick up and call people on the phone. It wasn't like that in 1914. Communication was, in fact, very difficult. What about the Serbian Prime Minister, Posits? Well, he felt very concerned because he had known about the plot in advance. He was aware, but too, well, too late to do anything about it, of the Black Hand plot to assassinate the Archbishop. And so he didn't want to admit that. It just made the whole country and him look guilty of the plot. In fact, he wasn't behind the plot. He had tried to stop it, but failed. In any event, that's why he, in part, tried to be as conciliatory as possible to the ultimatum. Russia didn't want war. On the other hand, the Russians didn't want to see weak. They didn't want their word to be disregarded, and they promised Serbia defense, so they felt compelled by that. But also, Russia is a very large country. It took weeks for the army, really months, for the army to mobilize. And so just in case, the Tsar gave the order to mobilize. Germany took that as a sign that Russia was prepared to go to war. And that's when Germany mobilized and began to prepare to fight. In France, well, the Prime Minister, Poincaré, was visiting Russia. And for most of the crisis, he was on a boat coming back from Russia to France. Britain was preoccupied with Irish troubles. There was a movement for Irish independence. Sir Edward Grey, who said the lights are going out all over Europe, was furiously negotiating and trying to prevent war. But in the end, he failed. Well, for all of these reasons, the dominoes began to fall without some of the key players really intending that result at all. Here you see the Serbian Prime Minister, Posits. This is the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas. And they were unwilling players, in a sense, in what was to become a huge conflict, an immensely damaging conflagration. In fact, both would end up losing, well, their lives or large parts of their country, both. Well, here is how the alliances shook out. In any case, the central powers there in brown, the allies in green, the neutral countries in yellow. In 1914, things started happening very quickly. The assassination took place on June 28th. War broke out by the beginning of August. In fact, the very first was when the declaration took place. By August 28th, there was already a major battle, Tannenberg. And September 3rd, just about a week later, Lemberg, all on the Eastern Front. Now, I've put in here little symbols to indicate what happened. And it's very easy, really, to remember who won or lost any battle in the First World War, as long as you know who was involved. There are some simple rules. First rule is Germany always beats Russia. That's what happened in the very first battle, Tannenberg. The Germans clobbered the Russian army at Tannenberg. The next battle was between the Russians and the Austro-Hungarians. The Russians always beat austria hungary That's the second rule. Well then, the Western Front saw action September 5th on the Mullern. That was between Germany and the Allies on the West, so France and England. There's a simple rule for all Western Front battles. They are always salients. Basically, <laughs> hundreds of thousands and they get to lose their lives, and the Allies barely move at all. And then, the Battle of Mansurian Lakes on the Eastern Front. Again, Germany trounces Russia. October 19th, another major battle on the Western Front, First Ypres. And the war goes on like that. There are a lot of these conflicts. These are major, major battles. Unlike things that anybody has seen since the Second World War, this gives you an idea of just the troop movements on the Eastern Front, related to Tannenberg, Lemberg, and Mansurian Lakes. It's complicated. Austria-Hungary is sweeping up from this direction, Germany from this direction, Russia facing both. It becomes complicated and involves vast movements of troops over vast territories. In 1915, there's another battle for the Missourian Lakes. Again, Germany throughout this Russia. March 18th, the Dardanelles. And starting, well, in April through August, the Battle of Gallipoli. What happened here is that Winston Churchill decided it would be a good idea to to attack the Ottoman Empire, to send a fleet of troops from Britain and also from Australia and New Zealand who would try to conquer Turkey. The result was a disaster, but a disaster for oddball reasons. We're going to talk more about this later, 
what happened is that they got to the Turkish coast undetected, they landed, and there was no communication with headquarters. There were no orders for a week. So what happened is the British, the Australians, the New Zealanders sat on the beach for a week before climbing the cliffs and attempted to move toward Constantinople, toward Istanbul. Um, they just sat there and did nothing. The result was that Atatürk had plenty of time to group his forces and amass forces on the top of them. So that by the time they actually did begin to advance, there was a huge Ottoman force facing them. The result was disaster. The British ended up losing 130,000 troops in that conflict. And in a sense, it all could have been over very quickly if they had just advanced as soon as they got there. But those kinds of communication problems went on throughout the war. Well, there was the Second Battle of Ypres. There was the First Battle of the Asanzo. That is a river that divides Italy from Austria-Hungary. Uh, that was the scene of 11 different battles. And this is another rule. Whenever Austria-Hungary fought Italy, it was a stalemate. Nobody won, nobody lost, except a lot of people lost their lives. The Armenian Genocide began in 1915. It lasted until 1922. Millions of Armenians were marched into the desert and murdered by the Ottoman Empire. As you'll see, the Ottoman Empire lost a vast amount of its population. It was mostly self-inflicted. Well, in 1916, the British finally gave up on their attempt and evacuated Gallipoli. February 21st, Verdun, one of the bloodiest battles of the war. The Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire starts on May 5th. And then, on July 1st, the Battle of the Somme. This is the bloodiest battle of the war. And I want to take us inside that battle a little bit. Um, in order to grasp the magnitude of this and why it has such a powerful effect on people's minds. But in any case, quickly, 1917, the beginning of submarine warfare and the Germans' attempt to ship the sink. Ships carrying supplies to the Allies, including American ships. March 1st, the Zimmerman telegram was made public. How many of you know what the Zimmerman telegram is? Ah, good. This is something I never learned about because I went to school in Pennsylvania and Virginia. And we were taught Virginia history. I mean, basically, yeah. yeah, things started in 1607 with the landing of James Hamilton, ended in 1865 with the South Lost. Of course, the Americans were dying. However, uh, yeah, um, what happened is that Germany had basically made an offer to Mexico, saying, join us, be on our side, and attack the United States in the end of the war, and we'll let you just have Texas and uh, California and all those other southwestern states. In any case, it infuriated the American public, although Mexico never responded to it. Um, the Tsar abdicated on March 15th, and Russia was in the process of withdrawing its forces from the war. April 6th, the United States declared war. French troops mutinied on April 14th, and July 31st, a hu another huge battle, sometimes called Third Ypres, or Passion Bela, which is, means the Valley of Summer. Uh, in any case, the Russian government fell on November 6th. More about that next time. Here is a photograph of Wilson reading out the declaration of war. And in 1918, the war finally ends. I won't go through all of that. Let's look at the Battle of the Somme and try to understand why the war had such a huge impact on people. This was the bloodiest battle of the war. 306,000 troops from all sides lost their lives. Assault. Uh, roughly four times that many were wounded but not killed. So we're talking about millions of people's lives, either ended or forever altered, in this one battle. This map shows you the lines at various points of the battle. What it comes down to is, although the battle lasted for months, the lines hardly shifted at all. Basically, nobody won this battle, nobody lost. Well, yeah, that gives you a map of the lines and the greatest point of movement during the battle. So you can see that it had almost no ultimate significance at all. And that general principle, vast suffering for no ultimate purpose at all, is part of what drives the reaction to the war. Well, what did take place? It began on July 1st. It ended in November 1916. 306,000, as I mentioned, died. Among the British side, 420 people, 420,000 people were killed or wounded. 60,000 were killed or wounded on the first day alone. Now think about that for a moment. 60,000 British the very first day. In the end, 
the British lost 96,000 dead. How many troops did the United States lose in Iraq? How many? 5,000? Uh, yeah, by the end, actually by now, I'm not sure, uh, but it's, I, I thought it was roughly around 4,000. Um, how many American troops were killed in Vietnam? About 50,000. So this is twice as many as the entire Vietnam War, and gosh, what? About 25 times as many as in Iraq, and all in just one battle of the First World War. The French had 200,000 casualties, 50,000 dead. The Germans have a million casualties, 160,000 dead. In this one battle alone, <coughs> here's what a German officer had to say about the fight. So, the whole history of the world cannot contain a more ghastly word. And what you're seeing in the background here are actual photographs of the battlefield at the Somme. One of the most dramatic things that happened on the very first day was this. 40,000 pounds of explosives were packed by a tunnel under the German lines. And near the beginning of the battle, the British detonated that, so a huge area of the German lines was exploded. Thousands were killed in that one explosion. <coughs> Nevertheless, it had relatively little result in the battle. One thing we see in the First World War is a dramatic departure between news reports that were informing the public about progress in the war and what was actually taking place. So take a look at these two accounts of the first day of fighting at the Somme. This is a journalist's account. I will imitate British journalists. <laughs> at about 7.30 o'clock this morning, a vigorous attack was launched for the British Army. The front extends over some 20 miles north of the Somme. The, attack, the, assault, the assault was preceded by a terrific bombardment lasting about an hour and a half. It is too early to as yet give anything but the barest particulars, as the fighting is developing in intensity. But the British troops have already occupied the German front line. Many prisoners have already fallen into our hands, and as far as can be ascertained, our casualties have not been heavy. Here is a machine gunner's account of the same thing. And now I will try to give you a London accent. Here I'm imitating a friend of mine who's from London, and I'll do it poorly as I do all accents. <laughs> The next morning, July 2nd, we gunners surveyed the dreadful scene in front of us. It became clear that the Germans always had a commanding view of no man's land. The British flag had been brutally repulsed. Hundreds of dead were strung out like wreckage washed up on a high water mark. Quite as many died on the enemy wires on the ground, like fish caught in the net. They hung there in grotesque postures. Some looked as if they were praying. They had died on their knees, and the wire had prevented their fall. Machine gun fire had done its terrible work. Which account was closer to the truth? Yeah, the machine gun took out, right? He was seeing what was actually taking place. Any journalist who was actually anywhere near the front lines would have seen that thousands were being killed, thousands more wounded, and this all in the first day of fighting. So keep in mind, 60,000 casualties that first day alone, just on the British side. So the result was a disaster. Now, why was it such a disaster? Well, World War I saw the advent of trench fighting, especially in the West. Those troop movements in the East were largely independent of trench warfare. That was a different game entirely in the East. But on the Western Front, the British, the French, the, the Germans were all dug into trenches. It was very, very difficult to attack a trench. The area between the trenches was called No Man Land. No Man's Land, it was strong with barbed fire. And machine gun encampments on both sides were set up to shoot down anybody who came into No Man's Land. So here you see troops trying to actually cross that area. It was an enormously dangerous and basically foolish thing to try to do. Well, the result was a series of battles which were, if not quite as bloody as the Somme, nevertheless staggered in the number of people who lost. Here are battle deaths at various other battles. For Dunn, 305,000, almost as severe as the Somme. Passchendaele, 150,000. Gallipoli, 130,000. Leverburg, 125. Frontiers, 115,000. The Second Battle of the A. 86,000. Second Battle of the Somme, 80,000. Second March, 80,000. Third, A, 64,000. And so on. Notice some of them. 11th, the Somme's 50,000. Why were there first and second and third and then 10th and 11th battles? Because the lines weren't moving. It was in the same place. And so these attacks kept being launched. They kept being repulsed with huge losses on both sides. Well, the result of that was a kind of 
magnitude of loss that is hard to appreciate. If you go to the cemeteries in northern France and look at the graves of American soldiers or British soldiers or French soldiers, they are staggering and there's just row after row of headstones. Here are the total numbers of deaths as far as people can ascertain for the various sides in the First World War. Germany, about two million military deaths, about a two and a half million overall. Russia, 1.8 million soldiers lost their lives, 3.3 million overall, lots of civilian deaths. France, 1.4 million soldiers killed. Britain, 1.1 million. Austria, 1.1 million. The Ottoman Empire, 771,000. Though look at the total number of deaths, almost 3 million people. Well, it goes on. Italy, 651,000. Serbia, 275,000. Romania, 250,000. The United States, about 117,000. And so on. In total, almost 10 million soldiers killed in the First World War. Over 16 million people in general killed by the war. And this isn't counting all of those who ended up dying due to famine, uh, due to disease, due to other kinds of problems. It's even more staggering if you look at the percentages of people killed. In Serbia, 16% of the population was dead by the end of the war. One out of every six Serbs. Okay, the Ottoman Empire, almost 14%, roughly one in seven. Romania, 9%, but one person in 11. In France and other yeah, Western European countries, it was low, but of course they had much larger populations. So France, over 4%. Germany, almost 4% of the population died. Italy, 3.5%. Austria, over 3%. Britain, 2.2%. These are absolutely staggering numbers. Consider the fact that in this class there are about 300 people. So if proportion, if you were dying in proportion, in just a few years even, this just took place over a four year period. If you were Serbs, that'd be like 50 of you in this class from dying. Ottoman Empire, that'd be like, well, what, 30? Um, France, about a dozen. So it was something that had an astounding impact. Now, of course, there I'm acting as if men and women were equally likely to be killed. Obviously, the military deaths, that wasn't so. And so among men of military age, take those numbers and multiply them by four, roughly, to get an estimate of how many soldiers, what percentage of soldiers actually died in the conflict. It's astoundingly high. Now, why was the death toll so severe? Why was this so much worse than any war before it? Part of it was trench warfare, which I've already met, or already talked about, but it was other things that you can really barely imagine from a contemporary point of view and that people couldn't imagine in advance. New technologies, machine guns especially, and artillery. For the first time, people were lobbing huge shells on the other side. It wasn't just off a ridge that grand explosion. People would soften up the trenches on the other side by lobbing large numbers of artillery shells, keeping up the bombardment for days before attacking. There was also a question of military strategy. The general attitude was you can't win a war if you don't attack. So what does a successful army does? do? Sorry, what does a successful army do? It attacks. It attacks again and again. You might think after the first wave of soldiers went over the lines, you would give up that strategy. But no, the idea was the more successful you want to be, the more you must attack. And so offense was the key. There was also a huge lack of information. People kept thinking that after the bombardments, the enemy lines would be easy to capture. It wasn't true at all. Although they caused immense damage on the other side, they were killing a relatively small percentage of the soldiers on the other side. Most shells missed their mark, at least in terms of hitting the front trenches, and so most of them were not doing the kind of damage they thought they were doing. There was also a lack of communication. Whenever there was a breakthrough and an opportunity to actually advance, they tended to blow it as a calamity because they couldn't communicate. Various groups of soldiers couldn't communicate with one another. They couldn't communicate with headquarters. In any case, for that reason, these attacks were largely futile and produced very little in the way of any kind of result. Well, you can imagine what happened with morale the front lines. By 1916, morale was so low that there were mutinies on all sides. People were refusing to follow orders. Commanders would give the command to attack get up out of the trenches and start advancing across no man's land. And a lot of people just refused to do it. It was a slaughterhouse. It was obviously suicidal. 
And so troops on all sides began to just refuse to follow orders. Now, I want you to think about how you, as a government official, might respond. If you hear that your troops on the front front line are ignoring orders to follow. In fact, what really infuriated the front line people on both sides is that during Christmas, the soldiers went out of the trenches on both sides, just agreed to a ceasefire, and in no man's land, celebrated Christmas. And both the German commanders and the French and British commanders were furious at this. And so how did they respond? How would you respond? <coughs> yeah. Yes, she said increased nationalistic pride, so they had a greater amount of fight. Now you might think a rational leader would have said, wow, we're sending people to a slaughterhouse so purposeless that actually maybe we should reconsider our strategy. Maybe this war isn't a good idea. If they're having a ceasefire in the right side, maybe we should have a ceasefire. But they didn't. Instead, they increased propaganda efforts. They tried to paint the other side as monstrous and make you think that the whole future of civilization depended on it. So here you see a German soldier, for example, sending a spear through a baby. Well, that's what those Germans are like. They'll cut the spear of babies. <laughs> uh, that naturally made compromise pretty difficult. How do you say today, the Germans are monsters, they're subhuman, and then tomorrow say, well, we're going to have a ceasefire, we're going to trust them to you know, make peace with us. So it made it much more difficult for people to back down. Here are some examples of that kind of propaganda. The world cannot live half slave, half free. The Prussian blot of the central power spreading throughout the center of Europe. President Wilson says of the Germans, their plan was to throw a broad belt of German military power and political control across the very center of Europe and beyond the Mediterranean Sea to the heart of Asia. They've actually carried the greater part of that amazing plan into execution. The Kaiser proclaims, For and death unto those who cause my death. Ah, death to the intelligence that I my mission. Let all the enemies of the German nation perish. God demands the destruction. Now, we've talked about how this war came about. Did it come about to the German plan for world foundation? No, no, the Second World War sort of did. So <laughs> you can say, well, this is just premature. <laughs> appropriate later. But in any case, it wasn't appropriate at all. Both sides started doing this. The Germans had similar propaganda about the British and the French. It was all insane. It had nothing to do with the actual basis for the fighting. Here's another example. Only the Navy can stop this. Well, in any event, by the end of the war, the map of Europe was redrawn. Serbia, on the winning side, despite losing one-sixth of its population, got control of a much larger territory, not only Bosnia and Herzegovina, but all of what gave Yugoslavia. Romania expanded to more than two times its previous territory, and Austria-Hungary was broken up into Austria-Hungary, uh, and then Czechoslovakia, which has now become the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. In any case, there was a significant change. <coughs> And what I really want to talk about today is the reaction, the loss of faith that came about as a result. You might have thought that, to some extent, all of these peoples who have been grouped together in one empire were going to insist on some degree of self-determination, and that the disintegration of Austria-Hungary was inevitable. That it would take the rest of Europe, and much of European culture with it, was perhaps not inevitable. But however you see that, the war did result in a loss of faith. Faith in political leaders, faith in democracy, faith in civilization itself. Now we've talked about the fact that it had already begun. George Bernard Shaw was already expressing a great deal of cynicism, as had Nietzsche before him. There was already a sense that the culture was somehow uh, falling apart, no longer had the kind of vigor that it had earlier. But the war greatly intensified that. It spread that feeling from a small group of intellectuals to the average person. And it changed, in that way, Western civilization forever. Here's the Philip Larkin poem I mentioned. Never such innocence, never before since. It's changed itself to past without a word. The men leaving the gardens tidied the thousands of marriages, lasting a little while longer. Never such innocence again. Ordinary life was either ended or disrupted for millions and millions of people and really for a very large percentage of people in formative ages, in the age where they might be in the military. And so the result of that was a loss of innocence, a loss of faith. People had seen immense destruction, hideous destruction, really, 
especially in the trenches. I want to take a moment to just think about what trench war warfare was like. What was it like to be a soldier in the trenches? Now, I've got to say, the German trenches, the German soldiers were not nearly as well equipped as the French. The British, they didn't have as much need, but their trenches were much better made. Uh, and the Germans were able to survive artillery attacks much better than the Allies were. In any event, what was it like to be, especially a British or French soldier, in the trenches? Yes. Okay, good. People were killed in the trenches around you. What happens to them? It's immensely dangerous to get out of that trench. And so there are dead bodies all around you. Okay, so, so yes, you might have to stand on another person's dead body just to see over the side of the trench and fire your machine gun. Um, you might be surrounded by bodies for days before they can actually be attacked. Really muddy and dirty. It's like it's like okay, good. This is an area of France that is rainy, that is sloppy. And so the trenches were almost always wet. There was frequently water up in people's knees. Uh, and in fact, just before the Battle of the Somme, there were several days of very heavy rain. So people were fighting that battle in the mud, with water up to their knees in the trenches. Now, what happened? I mean, think about that water up to your knees. What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to cause things like trench rot and other sorts of illnesses that are in the that. The dead bodies, I mean, the bacteria are just flowing back and forth. You have to go to the bathroom. What do you do? You can't get out from the train. You have to go in the trenches. It's just filled with water. Okay, so it's repulsive. People can smell, smell the trenches from miles away. You can tell when you were getting close to the front because the stink of the trenches really did extend from more than a mile in any direction. Tell me more about what it was like to be in the trenches. Yeah? Even if you did, like, try to make it across no man's land, and some people did, and they, they got to another trench and then there were gas bombs being thrown. Ah, good, the advent of gas. Yes, this was <laughs> uh, the beginning of the use of chemical weapons. And in fact, the chemical, chemical weapons treaty took place after the war to try to stop that. But yes, people began using chlorine, lesser gas, things like this, to attack the enemy troops. So you might get to those trenches only to get hit by that. Now, gas wasn't used as much as people later sort of talk about it. It was a new thing, it was dramatic, and it caused devastation initially. But two things kept it from being really quite as devastating. Actually, three things kept it from being as devastating as, as it might have been. The first is that it's very sensitive to wind conditions. And so if the wind shifts, your own soldiers can be attacked by it. And that happened in some cases, and that's largely why the Germans gave it up. Secondly, they found it was very dependent on weather conditions. It couldn't be used in the Eastern Front. People tried to use it there and found that the temperatures were too low, and but in the winter, it just sort of didn't do anything. Uh, but finally, people did find an end after uh, a few months of enduring these attacks. It turned out if you took a sock and peed on it and breathed through that, it would protect you. Now, how somebody first thought of that, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, they found, and then, of course, people began to use that to develop gas masks that didn't involve actually urinating on the spots and so forth. <laughs> but, but yes, that became a serious problem. There was one other thing you haven't mentioned, which is the lack of sleep. During the day, it's immensely dangerous to go to no man's land. But at night, you might have to go out to repair the barbed wire to retrieve bodies or something like that. And so all the work was done at night, so you weren't very observable. And there was kind of an agreement. Both sides would let the other out of the trenches at night to do what they had to do. Well, what that meant was that you had to catch whatever sleep you could during the day. But before any battle, there were days of bombardment, meaning that typical, typically people were fighting these battles having received, having basically had no sleep for two or three days before. Um, and troops, when they got back from the, from the front lines, would tend to just sleep for days because they had had no sleep on the lines. Well, the devastation was incredible. And here is how a German soldier reacts in writing all quiet on the Western Front. This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, least of all an invention. That is not the answer of those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell a generation of men who, even though they have escaped these shells, were destroyed by the war. He said, even those of us who survived were destroyed by this war. We were forever changed, and changed in ways that were highly destructive. It starts with something that seems like a happy scene. Okay, we're sitting five miles behind the front. Hey, we're relieved, we're happy, our bellies are full of beef and hard beans. 
Why are they having so much sausage and bread and beans? It's because there was a devastating attack. Most of the troops were killed. And so those who were left actually had enough to eat for the first time in weeks. So this is sort of a monstrous thing. But he says, yes, 14 days ago, we had to grow up and relieve the front line. It was quiet on our part of the sector. The quartermaster who remained in the rear had requisitioned the usual quality of food. But on the last day, an astonishing number of English heavies opened up on us with high explosive drumming ceaselessly on our position. We suffered severely and came back only 80 strong. So only about half the soldiers come back. But that's why they're happy, because now they get twice as much to eat. Now think about basically how that works. He talks about the last of sleep, or the lack of sleep. Last night, we moved back in seven thousand, and get a good sleep for once. Kaczynski is right when he says it wouldn't be such a bad war if we get a little more sleep. In the line, we went next to none. Fourteen days is a long time in one stretch. Fourteen days with virtually no sleep. Well, then, we, yeah, gosh, I don't really have time to depress you quite <laughs> as much as to talk about the, the deaths of some of his friends and so forth. But here's the key thing. He describes a loss of faith immediately in the officers. He says, well, we got into the officers. The artists, any of these officers have a great deal of experience. They know what was going on. They were older. They seemed wiser. But then you see the first time you're set up to action, acting in the orders of the officers, and large numbers of you are killed. He says, you immediately lose faith. You realize they weren't wiser. They didn't know anything. And in fact, all of this destruction seemed utterly pointless. Why did they let us down so badly? And so that's the theme that runs through the book. He says, we are a new generation because we've lost complete faith in the earlier generations. We used to think they had a wisdom to pass on to us. Now we see where that wisdom is going to lead. It led to this kind of destruction. We recognize they weren't wise at all. Next time, we'll look at how this plays out in Russia with the Russian Revolution.